Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Hope you had a great Easter. Welcome back to another week of no one having a clue what's going on in any way whatsoever. But everyone pretends like they do. That's, so we got that going for us. I love this video. Some, someone, uh, someone made a parody account of this show, the, uh, what this show's been the last few weeks, which is very nice. Here's what they put together. A vaccine, <laughs> you're looking at 12 to 18 months at least, at least. Uh, if you ask me, it's the second wave we should be worried about. Yeah. My name's Dougal Merton, and I am a certified armchair epidemiologist. Oh, you idiot, COVID-19 is the disease, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. <laughs> Hello. I graduated from the University of Wikipedia. Uh, it's uh, usually a two-day course, but uh, I had to go part-time due to my ongoing Tiger King commitments. So I had to spend a few extra days in the classroom. I overcame a lot of hurdles to become an armchair epidemiologist, uh, biggest of which was learning how to spell epidemiologist. I mean, there's three eyes in there, and I swear to God, they move every time. It was only a few days after graduation that I published my first peer-reviewed text message to friends and family. That peer review process was brutal. Dale, I think you put the eye in the wrong place. It's just not fair. Some people say I've taken it too far, but you know, it could be worse. Uh, I could be one of those people who started making their own sourdough. You buy some flour and suddenly you're calling yourself a boulangerie. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, so that's been me last couple of weeks, no doubt about it. But the truth is, like, no one knows what's going on, whether you're an armchair epidemiologist or you're, you're the chair of epidemiology at the top epidemiology school. No, no one... Fog of war. We, we, we've all heard that term before. It's from Karl von Clausewitz. He didn't actually say those words, fog of war. Here's the actual quote. He said, war, this is like uh, early 1800s. He said, war is the realm of uncertainty. Three quarters of the factors on which action in war is based are wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. A sensitive and discriminating judgment is called for. A skilled intelligence to scent out the truth. So in war, you can't know everything. Uh, you can't know, and maybe we can know now more with satellites or something, but back in the day, 1800s, you couldn't know for sure how many troops were on the other side of that hill or what their condition was or what their plan was. So every decision you made was made with very little actual information. I'm guessing it's still the same today, right? Maybe we delude ourselves into thinking because we have satellite images that we know things, but we still don't know. There's this fog of war, and same with viruses. We know so little. It's amazing that we know anything at all, to be honest. Like, it's amazing that we even know what a virus is and what a virus looks like and what the RNA makeup is of a virus, right? But still, we know so little. And that's what the virus itself, uh, economically, you can, we're not even in the same ballpark. Bank of America, they put out, uh, all the different banks put out their pre uh, predictions for second quarter GDP losses. Uh, bank of America says a 12% drop. Morgan Stanley saw a 30% drop. I read one bank had a 40% drop in GDP. The Atlantic said this is not a sign of economists having an informed debate. It's a sign that economists have no idea what's going on. And I don't blame them. I'm not critical of anyone here who could know what's going on in the midst of all of us. We are in a fog. I've been thinking a lot about this graph. I, I, we showed it to you weeks ago. It's about the Spanish flu. Can we throw it up here, guys? So this is the Spanish flu over the year and a half that it existed. Because we talked about this before with the uh, waves. Because, the, 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 you know, we're going to have another wave of this coming up here. Um, and the Spanish wave was by far the most deadly. So where are we on this graph? Right now, again, this is 1918, but where are we on this graph? Like, we could be anywhere. We could be at, like, maybe reaching the top of that very first little hill in the beginning, the first wave. We could just be right there having this conversation about how, oh, we're almost done, or we're almost in the clear, or whatever. We could be, it would not be close, or we could be coming, maybe we're coming down. Maybe we're on the end of that first hill. And we're like, oh, we should open back up again. But we have no idea still what's to come. Or good news, we could be we could be way at the end of that graph, and it could, the whole thing could be over tomorrow, and that or in the few next few weeks and months, and that's it. I, we have no clue where we even are on the timeline. All right, let's get my uh, let's put my University of Wikipedia degree to good use here. Uh, academic paper on the CDC's medical journal. Right, so it's not the CDC; it's their it's their own medical journal. Anyway, 
Uh, headline is high contagiousness and rapid spread of severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. It's from a uh, research at Los, Los Alamos National Laboratory. So here's the very short of it. The R naught, right? We've heard the word R naught before, R zero. That's how many people you can infect if you have it. Um, so how many people you give it to. So, and it makes a big difference. Every number makes a big difference. So if you remember, we played this clip a while back. If the R naught of something, oh geez, I'm ballparking here, but if the R naught is something like 1.2, then one point, you give it to 1.2 people and then they give it to 1.2 people. But, and if you do 10 iterations of that, it's something like 29 people get the flu. So if you have it, 10, 10 transmissions later, uh, 29 people have it. But if the R naught is three, you give it to three people, each of those people give it to three people, each of those people give it to three people, but you do that 10 times, 59,000 people got sick. So not 29, but 59,000. That's with an R naught of three. So you can see the exponential difference between those two things. So we got to figure out the R naught of this, how the, the spread, the rate of spread of this. We still don't know. Now we thought the R naught was 2.7. This guy, at Los Alamos, seems to think it's 5.7 which is way more contagious, ridiculously contagious. Puts us up there with polio or, or smallpox. Chickenpox is more contagious, but not as serious. Measles is also, way, measles is one of the most contagious things. Uh, the reason, so there's something called airborne droplet nuclei. So whatever, you sneeze, you breathe, and these things just, they just hang in the air, right? So TB, chickenpox, measles, someone can leave the room and those, those nuclei stay in the air for hours. So, so someone's in the room with measles, they breathe, the nuclei, they, for whatever reason, they stay in the air for hours and hours and hours. You come in later, you breathe it in, boom, you got it. It's that, it's that easy. Uh, measles has an R naught of, of 10 or 12, something like that. So we're not there. That's crazy spread. Um, good thing we have a vaccine. Uh, but 5.7 is still very, very high. And that's, I should say 5.7, that's without distancing. So that's if we just lived life as normal. And honestly, we'll see if this guy's right with places like India, who can't, they can't distance at all. India, unfortunately for them, is going to be the case study for the world. Now, here's the deal. That's why I bring this up. Is this guy right? I don't know. I have no idea. I have no clue. No stick of clue at all. No one has any idea. Epidemiologists, this scientist, whatever the scientist this guy is, they're as wrong as anyone else. But what matters isn't so much if this guy's right or wrong. It's how influential he is and how influential this paper is to the policymakers who then decide whether or not you're allowed to go outside. If he's right, if he, it, I mean, it, it, irrelevant, really. Because if he says it's five, here, here's the deal. If, the, if, that, if that guy's number, 5.7, is what's going to be used for models moving forward. And we're going to talk with someone who makes models coming up in this show a little later. Um, if that's the number that's going to be plugged into the models, pff, get ready. Like, like, it's game over. I'll put it like this. If the r not, if this guy came out and said, oh, geez, the r not, the spread rate, it's 1.5, then the politicians would say, oh, geez, whew, man, really dodged a bullet there. Okay, uh, let's kind of get back to normal. Let's, uh, you know... Restaurants can only have 50 people in them at a time, no events over, 200 people for a while. We'll kind of see how this goes moving forward, right? That's if it was a low number. But this guy came back and said it's 5.7. Even if it's not, if we act like it is, then politicians are going to come back and be like, oh, no restaurants ever. <laughs> you can't, no, you can't, still can't, you can't go anywhere at all. You can't go to church ever again until there's a vaccine, right? That's the difference between the and That's why that's a significant uh, figure or study that, that just came out. So again, here's the, the ultimate reality to, to start the week. Uh, is no one has any idea what's going on. If they tell you they do, they're lying. Or they have a defense mechanism that says they must be in control of all things, all times. I think the emoji of this, of this, time, of this era, of this season of our life, the emoji is... I said that to everyone. Everyone has... I don't know. There's no sign that this won't be the case for a long time. But here's what's also interesting about this. As frustrating as it is, as uncomfortable as that uncertainty is, not much has changed in that way. I heard a pastor say the other day that you haven't lost control. You've lost the illusion of control. That's all that's changed. You, we were never in control in the first place. We were just able to get to a point where we felt like we were in control. 
Uh, but that party's over. But the good news is you're still not. In, <laughs> you never were in control. Let me say one last thing about this R-naught number. Uh, this affects the herd immunity. We'll take another day. We'll talk about herd immunity. Actually, maybe we can do that next. We have our, um, our uh, colonel friend uh, coming up next. Uh, we can ask him maybe about this R about herd immunity. Because I think there's, like people throw it out there like, oh, we just need herd immunity. It's like, um, well, listen, you may not have gone to the University of Wikipedia like I did, but you can't just throw around the term herd immunity. Uh, so we'll get some more details on that. But if the R-naught, so the R-naught number affects herd immunity. So if the R-naught was like 2.2, like like, then, then you'd only need something like 55 or 60 percent of the people to have immunity before you can have herd immunity. But if the R naught is 5.7, then you need more than 82 percent of people to have herd immunity in order for this to not spread out of control. So whatever the R naught is, until there's a vaccine, I mean, we all still need to get ready for this thing to go for a long, long time. But then even the vaccine assumes that that's even positive. So the worst news that I've heard so far, and I forget if we even talked about this. Sorry if we haven't, but it's worth repeating if we did. Uh, a study came out recently. Uh, it wasn't a lot of people, maybe like 100 people. But a third of them, these are people who had COVID and recovered. A third of them had so few antibodies that it was barely detectable on the test. This is a big problem because this means if you get COVID and your body doesn't make enough antibodies, first of all, you're likely to get it again. So there's no immunity, really. But second, a vaccine may not even work, or it would be much more difficult, because if COVID doesn't give you the right amount of antibodies, what good will a weakened vaccine or a weakened version of COVID do for making antibodies? That's a big concern. We're going to keep an eye more on those immunity tests, or the antibody tests, uh, coming up here as we do more of them. Or, or the r naught is really low, and by some miracle we get a vaccine very soon, and who knows? Who knows? These next few months, it's going to be such an amazing case, interesting case on, on human behavior and how we act when we're living in uncertainty. How we act as individuals and how we act as, as a society. But again, we never really had control over anything in the first place, so nothing's really changed. I'll end with this quote. This is Leo Tolstoy. Um, War and peace. Uh, I want to thank Mark, Mark Manson for finding this quote. So Tolstoy said, In quiet and untroubled times, it seems to every administrator, every politician, everyone in charge, every leader, that it is only by his efforts that the whole population under his rule is kept going. While the sea of history remains calm, the rule administrator, the, the leader, naturally imagines that his efforts move the ship that he's holding on to. I'm the leader, I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, look what I'm doing, I'm keeping things peaceful and, and prosperous. But as soon as a storm arises and the sea begins to heave and the ship to move, such a delusion is no longer possible. The ship moves independently with its own enormous motion. The, book ho the boat hook no longer reaches the moving vessel and suddenly the leader, instead of appearing a ruler and a source of power, becomes, a, becomes an insignificant, feeble man. Aren't we all? Coming up next, we have our Colonel Friend, uh, we have someone from AEI who is doing some modeling projections about the economy. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk to her about models in general, but also you know, her take on, on what, what the economy could possibly look like moving forward. Actually, and her uh, analysis depends on what the r naught number is. So she, does, she did it a couple different ways. If the r naught's this, if it's this, or if it's this, what is the future going to look like? So we'll do the best we can with all that. Coming up next, true story, Mike Slayer. Glad you're here. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, I'm so grateful for uh, a lot of the experts that we've been able to talk to over the time here, but none more than Colonel Michael Lewis, uh, an infectious disease expert, uh, former uh, colonel, again, of the U.S. Army, who, again, was stationed in Southeast Asia when the SARS epidemic got broken in 2003, and obviously has been following the latest with all this. Colonel, awesome to see you again, sir. Uh, it's great to be with you, Mike. Let's, uh, I got a lot of questions about the R-naught. I got questions about herd immunity. We'll run through all that, but first, let me, can I just ask you, like, Good news, bad news that you've learned, that we've all learned since last we talked last week. You can start with the good or the bad, whatever you prefer. <laughs> well, that's an open-ended question, huh? Um, good news. I guess the, the best news is that um, everything I'm seeing shows that 
the acceleration, I will, you know, we're still getting more cases on a daily basis, but the acceleration of that, uh, the percentage is slowing down. So that means we're getting closer and closer to the top of the curve. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, bad news is our constitutional rights are just being absolutely hammered, um, depend on your locale and, and so on. So it, it's just kind of scary to see, you know, drive-in churches being, you know, people being ticketed for staying in their cars. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm, again, I'm a little bit more starting to get more concerned about our, uh, our country and our culture, um, you know, when you look at that balance between the two. Yeah, I, uh, I think Michigan seems to be the, well, Kentucky there too, but Michigan seems to be the worst. I saw Michigan governor w won't allow people to buy car seats. They call that a non-essential purchase. I don't understand. I don't like the idea of a governor deciding what's essential and what's not essential when it comes to Why would car seats ever fit in that category? Anyway, uh, well, I'm with you on that. I mean, um, but why, you know, when you've got a store open, why do you have shelves blocked off and some not blocked off? I mean, that's yes. just, if the store's open, the store's open. I, I mean, that's just yep, a it's I agree. insanity. Let's, uh, so uh, do you believe, you, you said good news is, uh, you know, the, the increase seems to be decreasing, <laughs> the rate of increase. Yeah, uh, no, I, do you, right, are you I, in, that's, are, I would call it the acceleration is decreasing. Once, once we can get to good. a deceleration, we'll be good. Do you anticipate a peak or a plateau? That's a great question. I hadn't even thought of it in that, in those terms. Um... Depends on how you want to define a plateau. I think we're going to, you know, it's not going to be a one day peak and then all of a sudden, boom, it's, you know, we're on the downhill slope. I, I think we may have, it's like the stock market. It may be a little bit up, a little down. Um, but I, I think the, the trend of going up is going to stop and it's going to reverse and it's the trend will be going down, but that um, that's not always going to be a straight line. Yeah. Can you talk about the R not? We we did a segment, this last segment, um, and this guy in Los Alamos determined 5.7, right? So I don't know, maybe you can give us some insight into how one would even find that number, but also um, how that affects our calculus moving forward as a country. Well, you start to get into literally, you know, calculus math um, when you start using uh, mathematical modeling and one of the inputs that you would use for that is the R naught and so in basic terms again and I'm sure you've gone over this a hundred times an R naught of one means that one person transmits it to an average of one other person an R naught of two means it's going to be exponential you know one person generally in on average affects two people so an r naught of five means that one person affects an average of five people so you can imagine you know you just do a couple of generations beyond that uh and you know exponentially it's the bigger they are not obviously the the worst uh worst case scenario is with that uh how that's determined is you really can't determine that without good testing and controlled mm. conditions. So things like Iceland, uh, you know, where they've tested a large percentage of the population, they that's gonna give you a better estimate of what the R naught is. Uh, the, what was the Diamond Princess um, cruise ship? Uh, you know, they know, you know, everybody was tested multiple times there and they know how many people became sick and so on. So that gives you better estimates. But the problem that we face is the virus that's found its way to Iceland may not be and probably is not the same that we're seeing in New York City versus what we're seeing in Los Angeles versus what we're seeing in Singapore. Uh, so, you know, this virus Explain. is- Explain, what, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, what, what does that mean? Well, what, so viruses change over time. I don't remember who we talked about this last week, but you know, viruses change over time. And, and that actually is to our advantage um, because viruses have been around longer than mankind. They, they need a host to be able to survive. And so um, if a virus is killing off its host too quickly, the virus is not gonna survive and that's just part of nature. And so over time, a virus tends to become less virulent. 
And while it may be more infectious, it's going to kill less of its hosts because otherwise it's not going to survive. And so that's just sort of a basic law of nature. And so as these things change um, through its interaction over time and space and interactions with the with humans and their hosts, it's going to change at a, you know, at the microscopic level, at the you know, at the DNA, RNA level where, um, you know, it, it may be something as simple as a substitute, uh, you know, you go back to the basics of genetics and the four, um, the four aspects of genes. You know, you switch an A for a T or a G for a C, that changes things down the line. Mm, wow. Okay. So... Because I, 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 we, we played a clip in the last segment of uh, armchair epidemiologists, and I graduated from the University of Wikipedia recently, so thank you. I see some degrees behind you, not as fancy-smancy as mine, but uh, did some research on, on the Spanish flu and how it mutated, and their, their idea was that it mutated uh, for the worse, for the second wave, perhaps? So, so you mentioned before that they tend to mutate m to be more virulent, less deadly. Is that tend to be the case or always the case? How's that tend, tends, You know, there's no absolutes, but yeah, it becomes, it be, you know, a virus, if you think of it um, in the worst terms possible, uh, like if you were making a horror movie, um, yeah. you know, how could you design it to be, you know, be the worst thing is, you know, it, let me back up a half a second. Um, yeah. Things like Ebola. Ebola, you know, if you look at the original, uh, you know, from 20 plus years ago, Ebola killed like 90 plus percent of people that it, you know, that it came in contact with. Now that that fatality rate is 40, 50 percent, um, mm -hmm. because you know it's not going to survive if it kills 90 percent of the people that it comes in contact with. And so, um, but the, the frightening thing is if it becomes um, more easily transmitted between people. So we're lucky with Ebola and HIV and other types of viruses in that it's got to be really blood contact, uh, very, you know, uh, very intimate contact. The problem with influenza and of course the coronavirus is it's not that that blood contact uh, or, you know, an, or other kind of very intimate things like that. It's really, it's airborne. And so airborne is a very easy way to spread a disease, but you combining an airborne delivery system, if you will, with a lethal virus just aren't, it's not really compatible, but somewhere in there, there's gonna be a balance. And if you were gonna design a bad horror movie, you're gonna find that balance where it's easily spread and kills lots of people, but that's not really the reality of nature. Um, can we talk a bit about herd immunity? Because the r not obviously plays a role in that. I feel like people throw this idea of herd immunity out there without obviously having a full understanding of it. So what, I think we get the basis of it, right? You, it's enough people have antibodies so that it doesn't spread through, the, just, just just rip through a population. But what are some variables there that, that matter? Well, some of the, the most important herd immunities, if you think about a, uh, a refugee situation and say, um, you know, I, I'm gonna pick on Rwanda because uh, that's just whatever sure. popped into my head. Um, and you look at a refugee situation where you have refugee camps with potentially hundreds of, you know, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people living in very squalor conditions, uh, poor access to everything, you know, everything from food to sanitation. And you get measles that could potentially rip through that population very quickly. Those are some of the best modelings that we understand. It's, a, it's an airborne disease. Um, and we know that you, there's a tipping point somewhere, and it depends on the disease, somewhere generally between 60 to 80% of the people, um, generally about, yeah, if you figure about 60% of the people, and there's very specific numbers that you can look up and you can research for disease by disease. But um, when that number of 
percentage of people, and this is very localized, not just, you can't put a blanket across the country and say, okay, 60% of people, because 60% of people might be 80% in New York and 20% in Montana. So it really becomes much more localized um, where you, it basically drives that R naught down. So if you've been exposed to the virus and you have immunity to it, you're not going to get it and pass it on because you've already kind of been through that. And so it basically drives the R naught down uh, to the point where less people are becoming more, uh, less people are becoming affected by whatever the disease is. Um, so, sh so what short, we're looking short for of. Is Sorry, short of refugee camps or vaccines, because that's obviously what vaccines do. It gives us all herd immunity. So short of that, is it possible for a people, a country, a city, to get herd immunity naturally? Or is that just, is that just take way too long and not possible? No, I, I, you know, there are some arguments out there that, you know, there are certain, I'll say, scientists or at least people that seem to have access to be able to get word out. Uh, that argue that we should never have done any kind of social distancing. Uh, we should just let everybody get the disease and herd immunity will happen very quickly. Well, that's great in theory, but if it overwhelms the emergency medical system and, and is killing people left and right, uh, we kind of kind of got screwed on that one. So yeah. this whole flattening of the curve is not about how it's not about, well, it is about herd immunity, but it's really about not overwhelming the me emergency medical system. And do so- Do you think almost it, everyone will get this over time? Do almost I, everyone, do you think it'll be- I, well, yeah. I, yeah, I think that we're gonna, you know, if we were to do, be able to test everybody in the United States a year from now, I think that we would see massive, numbers of people that had been exposed to this. Wow. Um, okay. One of the uh, you know, one of the better good news side of things is that we don't, uh, you know, for people that have a good healthy immune system, they're generally not having significant issues with this. There's always exceptions. I mean, I've got a good friend, a naturopathic doctor who down in Puerto Rico, and she is young, she's healthy, she's a naturopath, she does, you know, lots of, you know, vitamins and minerals and all the things that you would think, and she's sick as a dog, but she's gonna get through this. Now, um, other people, you know, uh, again, it's the vulnerable people, uh, when I see, oh, they did had no comorbidities and they show a picture of somebody and they're a hundred pounds overweight, <laughs> that's a comorbidity, you know? So yeah. being healthy in all aspects, you know, exercising on a regular basis, eating um, a healthy diet, not eating junk foods and the sugars, but not being overweight with heart disease and diabetes, all these things make your risk greater that you're going to have a bad outcome or be sicker yeah. um i know we kind of just went yeah. probably in about five different directions there sorry about that no 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 that's that's, that's aren't we all <laughs> that's where we are in the midst of this but that's why i, I hate it we got to go colonel but that's why i'm so grateful you're here and we can try to make sense of this together over the probably months that this is still going to be a thing I, I, it's going to be months mainly because we're doing the social distancing and that's flattening the curve. Yeah. And on the downside of that, that also makes yeah. us last longer. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. All damn right, Colonel. You, awesome. Damn if you to, do, damn uh, if you don't, unfortunately. No, nah, that's right. Everything's a trade off. Dr. Uh, Michael Lunas, Colonel, I'm always good to talk to you, sir. Appreciate you. All right, Mike. Hopefully, talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Okay. Coming up next, we'll talk right. with someone from uh, AEI about some economic modeling that they've done in the midst of all this. is coming up next. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders. We're all trying to make sense of everything and trying to get 
like some idea of what the future might look like moving <laughs> forward. And it's so hard to do that, but I'm so grateful for Professor Anna Sherbina uh, from Brandeis University, a professor of finance uh, and uh, at the American Enterprise Institute as well for, for trying to do this for us and giving us some idea of what's happening. She has a paper called Determining the Optimal Duration of the COVID-19 Suppression Policy, a Cost-Benefit Analysis. Professor, how are you today? I'm pretty good. Thank you, Michael. And thank you good. for inviting me onto this program. My, my pleasure. So let's first talk about models. Let's do a quick one minute introduction because that's like the thing of the month, models, and the problems with, the failures of, the uh, benefits of, the limitations of. So kind of wrap, help us understand models. Models, so you're trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. And you have to have a model of this disease, how this disease is progressing. So probably you have talked, you have heard everybody talking about R naught. So R naught is very important uh, for measuring how quickly an uh, infectious disease is spreading. So R naught for COVID nineteen is actually quite high. I assume it's two point four. That's uh, something that came out of papers that have studied this disease. And it's actually um, on the high end. So 2.4 or not means that on average at the beginning of the pandemic, when nobody has immunity to this disease yet, a person who is ill infects 2.4 people on average. For regular seasonal flu, R not is about 1.2. So you see it's much smaller. For measles, it's actually much, much higher than that. But 2.4 is actually quite a high R naught. The problem with this disease is that it's very infectious because nobody has immunity. Unlike with seasonal flu, some people get vaccinated, some people have immunity from prior exposures. Here, nobody has immunity. And this disease is very deadly. It's, some people say, 10 times as deadly as seasonal flu. And so this is something that you have to have on the model in order to calculate the damage from this disease. Yeah. What are some limitations of models? Because we need them, because we got to have some concept of what's happening, but what are some limitations of them? Some of the limitations of models in my particular case is that there's so many unknowns. So for example, right now we're in the suppression phase, we're in the lockdown phase, and it would be really nice to know how well this lockdown is working. We know it's working, the number of new cases is coming down, but how quickly um, I don't really know for sure. I have a couple of assumptions for how to model it. So now I model that the number of new cases is decreasing because I assume that R0 is less than one at this time, meaning that one person who is infected infects less than one person on average. So the number of new cases has to decrease. But of course, once we are done with the lockdown and we'll go into the next phase, which is the mitigation phase, where we will try to do everything possible to slow the spread of this disease, R0 will have to go up just because we're not going to do as much social distancing anymore. Each person will meet more people on average. So R0 will be higher and the number of new cases will go up. So I don't assume that R0 will go back to 2.4 it's not going to be as high as in the no interference scenario, but it's still, I assume, is going to be higher than one. I like in your model, uh, in your analysis here, the paper, you, you, you run it in a couple different ways, right? So you run it if the R0 is lower, if it's medium, if it's higher, and, and kind of how that changes things. And I appreciate that. So as we move forward, we can make better sense of it. Let, let me ask you about um, cost. Can we define cost? Because that's the point of this paper, is what this is going to cost us, our economy. So how do you define costs? Um, yeah, that's a, it's that's a, a huge term. Right, because we're trying to do the cost benefit analysis. We know that if this disease rages on, people are going to die, right? So you have to put a cost on people dying. And this is something that is done all the time in uh, policy decisions. You have to assign a monetary value to a person's life. So I have a monetary uh, value to people dying. We're trying to save people from dying. So it's kind of like saving money. And so the value of statistical life is a monetary value that comes from academic papers. And that's what I'm using in this model. And it's how, do you, how, do, how, have, how, have, how have professors done that? Because like, like, 
That's so, I mean, like morally, ethically, like that's really difficult. So how do you, it's like really finance professor, deal with the ethicists? You know what I mean? How do you figure that out? Yeah, so that's not my area of research. I take it as given. But people who have done it, Aldi and Vescuzzi is the paper that I'm using, they look at how much risk people are willing to take and how much compensation they need for taking this risk. So there are certain jobs that are very risky for your life. For example, construction, you could die. You could fall from great heights and die. Mm -hmm. And so you demand an extra compensation for this type of job versus a very safe job. So that's something that they extrapolate from the extra salary that people get paid in risky jobs mm -hmm. to see how much people value their lives. So it's kind of oh, like saying, if you have a 1% chance of dying, how much extra compensation you need. So it's okay, not- Okay, so perfect, what have they determined? Do, is, they put a, do, they, do they put like a range of number on it then? Yeah, so I, I have a range of values for different age bins. So it's, uh, uh, you know, increasing up to around the age of 30, 40 years old. And then it starts decreasing again because people who are older, they're just not willing to pay as much or not dying. So you could imagine somebody who is 80 years old, they're not going to pay as much for medical interventions to prevent them from dying. Yeah, interesting. So that, this makes sense to what we've been that. saying. If we were making sense of it with kids. If kids were getting sick, then that would change the equation completely. Because yeah. on to your point, the cost of a child is, is more than someone who's maybe 90 years old. Uh, well, what actually, number? That's not Can, necessary. Sorry, Michael, I just wanted to clarify. It's not no, in this particular estimation. People have a little bit of a disagreement if uh, the cost of a child is higher or lower than for an adult. So in my particular case, I use a lower cost for a child. Other people would say it should be higher. I don't take a stand on it because in this particular disease, it doesn't really matter because kids have a yes. very, very low chance of dying. It doesn't really influence anything. Yes. Yeah, fair. Wow. I wonder, and we don't have to do this now, but I wonder why someone would put a lower cost on a child than not. That's interesting. We'll save that for the philosophers. Um, okay. okay, so give me a number. What number are you guys working with? So the number that I'm working with, so uh, if uh, this disease rages on, people are going to die. People are going to get sick in large numbers. When somebody is sick, they miss work. So their productivity declines because they're staying at home or they're staying at home and taking care of their relatives. In addition, people who are sick go to the hospital, use medical services. So the cost has three components. The cost of somebody missing work, the lost productivity. The second component is using medical services, all these medical costs. And the third, the highest one, is the cost of the lives that we'll end up losing. And so altogether, I estimated that if we just uh, do not interfere, let the pandemic take its course, it will cost the US economy over $9 trillion. So therefore, it is obvious that we have to do something. We have to do a non-pharmaceutical intervention. Okay, so again, let me, let me explain. So you're saying if we, if we did nothing, People will get sick, so productivity will go down. Healthcare costs will be super high. And then the cost of dying on top of that equals right. $9 trillion. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Is there another factor there that if you could do it again, maybe you wish you could put in there? Or if you, if it was even knowable, you, you would put in there if you could? Sorry, what would I put? Yeah, if, if, you, if you could put another factor in there that maybe you didn't because... You know, it's impossible to know. Is there any other yeah, factor you would put in there? To know. So I think I might be underestimating the cost of this disease because now the data came out from China that there are long-term consequences of somebody getting ill. Uh, that people don't yes. go back to normal. They have long-term health consequences. And so what that means is that I'm underestimating the true cost of this disease. Yeah, so that's a good point, because maybe in 10 years down the road... Yeah, so uh, we don't really know when people go back to normal, if they ever go back to normal, but that means that there are longer term costs that I'm not really estimating in this model. Okay, very good. Uh, we have to take a break, Professor. Can you stick around and we'll, we'll break down a couple other um, numbers that you, 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 come, you concluded here? Okay. So yeah, nine trillion is if we do nothing. So now that we've done stuff, we'll find out what the professor has uh, concluded next. We'll do that uh, coming up. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word.
Hey, Psychic Crusaders, we're talking with Anna Sherbina, Professor Sherbina of Finance at Brandeis University, also at AEI, American Enterprise Institute. Her paper, Determining the Optimal Duration of the COVID-19 Suppression Policy, a Cost-Benefit Analysis. Uh, difficult thing to do here, but uh, I'm grateful, Professor, that you went through this. So last segment you said, if we did nothing, decrease productivity, increase healthcare costs, and the cost of dying, if we did nothing, you think it would cost us $9 trillion. I should say, is that America, not the world? It's just America, right? And in America, okay. Okay, so nine to put this number in perspective, is forty percent of U.S. GDP. It's a huge. No number. kidding! Wow. Okay, I'm glad you said that, because we're throwing trillions around like it's nobody's business. So I'm glad you put. Okay, forty percent GDP. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, now that we've done something, uh, what do you calculate now? So now that we are doing the lockdown, we're decreasing the chance that somebody who is infected will meet somebody else and pass on this disease to others. And in this particular case, um, COVID-19 is like the flu in a sense that even before you have symptoms and even if you don't have symptoms, you could infect other people. So even though we now raise the awareness of this disease and people who are sick, who have temperature, they are likely to stay at home. Uh, a lot of people are asymptomatic. So right now the data came out that maybe about 40% of people are asymptomatic, so they could still infect others. And it's really important that people that stay, uh, you know, try to stay at home and try not to come close to others. And it seems like it's working right now. We are able to decrease the number of new cases. And so the question is, how long do we stay in the lockdown? When do we lift the lockdown and go into the next phase, which is the mitigation phase? Or if you look at Scott Gottlieb's plan for reopening the economy, he, he has a plan with his co-authors, the roadmap map to reopening. Uh, yeah. The next phase would be phase two, the mitigation phase, where we uh, reopen the economy to some extent, but still try to limit social interactions to some extent. And, um, I make an assumption what this mitigation phase is going to look like. So again, in terms of the R not. So because we will reopen the economy, so each person will probably have more interactions with others. The rate at which you pass on the disease will go up. And I assume I, I make a couple of different assumptions. I assume that if the number of new cases is very low, we could mitigate better. So we could better do contact tracing, isolate, all the people that an infected person came in, in contact with. So then R0 will increase to 1.1. If the number of new cases is high, I assume over 50,000, then R0 will be higher because we won't be able to do as much uh, contact tracing, for example, we won't be able to contain the disease that much. And so okay. I make a couple of different assumptions. And uh, what I calculate is that uh, depending on how well the lockdown is working right now, we could reopen the economy um, optimally within the next nine to 17 weeks, depending on how well it is working right now. Okay. And if we uh, wait for this optimal points for when to reopen the economy, we could achieve the savings of about 3.7 trillion, which is actually quite high. What do you mean by save? We will save money uh, for the US economy in terms of preventing people from getting sick, right? So okay. if we uh, continue the suppression policy, we will reduce the number of cases, we will reduce the number of people who are ill and who will pass on the illness to others. Okay, and, and this is so the 3.7. Right? Yeah, so that's compared to the 9 trillion where we do nothing. But what, we do nothing. Are you able, so, know, yeah. Sorry, are, are you able to factor in there? I'm sorry, sorry for the delay here. Are we able to factor in the cost of shutting things down, right? So the yes, thought, so this the is cost, net of the cost. The, exactly, that's net of the cost of shutting things down. So yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to clarify, Michael, that nine trillion, that's if we do nothing. And we know that we're not doing nothing. We will, uh, in any case, not just reopen the economy to 100% extent. We will do mitigation. So that means we will still have a ban of big, on big gatherings. We will probably still discourage people from flying. We'll encourage people for, uh, to work from home. So nine trillion is not is something hypothetical because that's not an option. Yes, that's but right. But compared okay. to reopening sooner, if we reopen later at an optimal point, that's when the savings will come in. So if we open right now, 
versus if we reopen nine weeks or 17 weeks later, we could save the economy 3.7 trillion. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, what are some unknowns that we're gonna keep an eye on out, eye on out for moving forward? So there are unknowns. Uh, one of the unknowns that I discussed is that we don't really know how well the lockdown is working right now. We've been in the lockdown for three weeks. It seems like it has started to work, but at least it's unknown to me at this point how quickly it is decreasing the number of new cases, right? So we know the number of deaths has been high, has spiked, but it's the people who got sick a couple of weeks ago who are dying at this point. So what yeah. we really need to know how well this lockdown is working in terms of reducing the number of new cases. And the biggest unknown in my model is how well the mitigation phase is going to work, right? So uh, yeah. we really are going to be able to keep R naught to 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, or is it going to spike again? I think yeah, we'll yeah well, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, if everyone just goes back crazy and goes to concerts right. and sporting events or whatever, and then it spikes back up and then we're back up to $9 trillion again. Okay, um, Anna, hey, we got to run, but thank you for breaking this down. The paper, I'm going to put it on my Twitter, Slater Radio on Twitter, so people can read it. It's not long, and it's, it's written well, obviously, so everyone can understand this, but I'm, thank you for giving us something to, something to hold on to as we decide what to do next. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Anna Sherbina, uh, AEI, AEI.org. Uh, All right, Slater Crusaders, thanks for being here today. Thanks to all of our guests. Um, I mean, <laughs> remember, remember the emoji of the, of the season? <laughs> Mike Slater Show. True stories. Spread the word.